Good morning. Uh, here we are going to discuss, have a discussion of our current affairs sessions, like the economics related current affairs in the recent times we are going to discuss over in this video. And me, myself, Mohammed Shemil. So we'll have a look at certain current affairs that has come up for, that has been becoming more and more prominent and could potentially be very important for your UPSC examination. So we'll the government has recently launched an index which is called as the IIBX. What is this thing called as an IIBX? The idea of an IIBX is a relatively newer construct in India. IIBX stands for International Bullion Exchange, India International Bullion Exchange. So what does Bullion mean? Bullion basically refers to the gold and the silver, not in the ornamental form or in the coin form, but mainly the gold and silver in the bar form, the, like you uh, colloquially even call it the gold biscuits and all. So that thing is basically what's what, what being converted into coins or being ornaments, etc., etc. So the idea of having an international, India International Bullion Exchange is to facilitate bullion imports into India. So this bullion gets imported from a whole lot of sources. It comes from the Gulf, it comes from the Africas, it comes from nations like Switzerland. So if you have an exchange like IIBX, it would say all the bullion imports for domestic consumption cha shall be channelized through the exchange. The objective of having an IIBX is to make sure all the domestic imports of the bullion comes through the single channel called as IIBX, which means the government can have a fairly good idea about where, the, is, um, where this bullion is coming from, where it is going to, and there will be a whole lot of transparency involved, and it will give the government an idea about the amount of gold that's present in the nation. So this is going to be an exchange ecosystem whereby if I am an importer, I can go and buy bullion from the exchange. So it's very, the operations will be very similar to that of a stock, stock exchange. But the idea is what transactions happen is that for the bullions. So the exchange ecosystem is expected to bring all the market participants at a common transparent platform for bullion trading and provide efficient price discovery. One key highlight or a very why the exchanges are important is for their efficiency. If I am going to buy a share directly from a company, it is going to be highly inefficient because the cost of selling that shares will be higher for the company. So there are going to be many inefficient scenes those. But when it comes to the stock market, stock market makes the things efficient. Similarly, IABX is going to make things efficient. The sellers will get the best of the prices. They will be able to assure the quality of the gold and they will be able to enable integration with other segments of the financial market. See, now, the gold, you have the gold market, you have the government securities market, all is acting in silos separately. So with something like IABX, government will be able to bring in a coordination between this and make India a dominant uh, trading hub of the gold in the world. So this is India's first international bullion exchange. And where is it to come up? Where not? It's only in gift. You have... The government is uh, promoting this Gujarat International Financial Tech City in Gandhinagar, which is an IFSC. Uh, IFSC stands for International Financial Service Center. International Financial Service Center. So the idea of an International Financial Service Center is to promote financial activities in the domestic nation and that to catering largely to the requirements of people outside the nation, the foreign uh, transactions, all these type of things handling. So within the, the government is going to promote IIVX, which means they will be able to capture a whole lot of the trade on the bullion that's happening with the other nations where India is not a party to. So bullion basically refers to physical gold and silver of higher purity that is normally in the form of bar, ingots or coins and the regulator of the IABX is going to be the IFSC authority. Now, now we draw our attention to a very contentious issue, an issue of that, of that of pensions. So you must have been hearing in the news about this old pension scheme, new pension scheme, etc, etc. We'll have a comparison of the old pension scheme vis-a-vis -vis the new pension scheme. Also, when you go for your examinations, 
you have to prepare on the pension schemes not just the old pension scheme and the new pension scheme the other pension schemes like the adal pension yojana or even the pradhan mantri shram yogi man dhan these type of pension schemes you have be very well versed with because upsc has a habit of asking on the pension schemes and when they ask on the pension schemes the questions are actually very specific regarding the eligibility the ministries you can't have you can't you can't assume that by having a way guide you will be able to answer those questions you will not be able to so the pension scheme preparation of spe- pension scheme in its full fledged is a must for you before you go for examination so what is this ops or the old pension scheme according to the scheme of ops pension is being offered to the government employees on the basis of their last sal- sal- drawn salary see at the time of my retirement if i am get having 50000 rupees as salary i would get 25000 rupees as pension from uh, there after so what is the advantage or like what's the most attracting feature of this old pension scheme which is forcing the workers in the public sector to demand some or uh, the old pension scheme it's because a defined benefit to the retiree no matter whatever happens after my retirement i will get this much amount 50% so this was very good from a workers perspective because it gives you social security after your retirement but you need to be mindful of the fact that we are speaking about a nation like india where only a very few people who working in the public sector have access to this sort of social security so whenever you are trying to improve the social security of a very few people like the, these are actually the cream of the society a very few people work in the public sectors so when you're trying to improve the pension of this very few sectors there is going to be an opportunity cost where is the money going to come from that money is going to come from that if the money has to be put in for this ops by the government government will have to cut uh, money on the expenditure spending to the agriculture the subsidies that is being given the public distribution system expenditures so the poor people suffers when the government when the government tries to improve the situation of uh, the public sector employees see only if you think in terms of opportunity cost will you be you will be able to appreciate the drawback of this ops otherwise looking only from the laborers perspective ops is excellent so if you are a nation who have finite amount of resources like the scandinavian nations you should definitely go for ops but in a nation like india where we are resource constrained you need to think about where is this money going to come from that's where the problem of ops comes in so government uh, was finding it very difficult to find fund the pension year after year so even if you have a look at the state uh, the classic state of the example of this could be the state of kerala so in kerala if you have a look the government's revenue expenditures are uh, more than 30% of the revenue expenditure is going just into the pension component and this is just going to increase only so the government was thinking about how to reduce this and they came up with the idea of nps in 2003 and the ops was discontinued from 2003 onwards so th- the problem is the liability remain unfunded every year the government has to pay uh, use the money out of its budgets or from the taxes or you have to take a loan this means there is no source that you have you are saying you are the government is saying we'll give you money but we'll find it somehow somehow no clear plan of that so this is going to create intergenerational liquidity issues also because if the government has a huge pension burden the government has to give that and in order to give that the government may be forced to take a debt so the government being forced to take a debt mean in the future the government will have to the future government the future generation will have to pay the interest of that so this is a dichotomous situation and that's where the government decided to go for nps nps came up or in april 1st 2004 introduced by the central government if you have a look at the upsc prelim previous year question papers they have asked a question about nps and it was a very specific question so this statement was there so you need to understand who are the eligible beneficiaries of the nps it is open to the employees of the public sector private sector and even the unorganized sector people if i want to open an account in nps i can 
except those of armed forces. This clause is very important. The armed forces pension is a separate story. You don't have this contribute. You just you are just still being defined by the something similar to the OPS. So now what happens is in the NPS, my social security post retirement is not just government's responsibility. It's my responsibility also. So every month I am asked or one second. In every month, a particular amount will be deducted from my salary and this will be paid or deposited in the NPS account. Also, government will also make a matching contribution. Suppose if I put 2000, government will also put 2000. And at the time of this retirement, this would be a good enough money. Because if I work for 30 years and if I'm putting some money every month and the government is also putting something, that would be good money. So at retirement, if I am in need of money, I can take this certain percentage. A percentage of this can be withdrawn immediately. The remaining money will stay there. And from that remaining money, my, my pension will be paid. So the idea is, if it's what, which is the money that I'm getting at the time of retirement and after retirement, it, a portion of it is which I have saved. So the funding source is clear at least to a certain extent. What about the remaining extent? So what happens is, suppose if I give my money to the NPS, it is uh, managed by PFRDA, Pension Fund Regulatory and Development Authority. What they will do is, they will invest this money in certain security, uh, market-linked securities. It could be an equity securities, it could be a debt securities. Normally, they do not invest it in high volatility stocks and all. They would invest in stocks which are almost sure of getting returns. And mostly, they will invest in debt-related instruments. It's to make sure that rather than the pro huge profit component, what is most important is to maintain there is at least the money does not go. Because if this money goes, the people will not have pension. So the PFRDA manages these funds. And to be frank, the PFRDA manages these funds very well. And at retirement, uh, me and my government has given something like 30 lakh rupees. They would have invested somewhere and made it something like maybe 35 or 40 lakh rupees. So this is the money that I get post-retirement. So there is money being generated out of these funds. So the, you, there is this identification of the source where this money comes from. That is why NPS becomes important. Now, why has NPS is been in use? Because certain states, Punjab, Jharkhand, Rajasthan, Chhattisgarh, Himachal, uh, all has been, these people, these states has said they are going back to the old pension scheme. And one interesting feature of these states is most of these states are the BJP rule states. Not almost all are BJP rule states. So it's actually counter to the government. But when you go back to the OPS, you need to have an idea where are you going to fund your money from. That problem does exist over there. Even NRIs are also eligible to join the new pension scheme. Any Indian citizen working between 18 to 60 years of age can is eligible to apply. So that's basically about the couple of pension schemes, the NPS-OPS debate. Now we'll focus our attention on the internationalization of rupee. Uh, in our earlier session on current affairs, we had a discussion about dollarization and de-dollarization. The de-dollarization is an attempt to reduce the usage of dollars in the domestic economy and also the international transactions that India has with other nations. Internationalization of rupee is also not much different. International of, uh, internationalization of rupee is the is may, of India is making efforts to reduce the US dollar to stabilize the Indian rupee. See, when each and every of our trade related transaction, each and every of our export and import is settled in dollars, that increases the demand for dollars too much. When the demand for dollars is so high, it puts a pressure on the government, uh, the reserve banks, foreign exchange reserves, etc., etc. So internationalization is an attempt to popularize rupee more and more as much as possible. And as a result, you make sure that you don't need dollars anymore. When you don't need dollars, or at least you reduce the amount of dollar requirement, so you don't run into this type of uh, BOP crisis, etc., etc. 
Now, if you have a look at India's import bill over the past couple of years, the import bill has been high. The current account has been in deficit. If, if one reason for this has been the increasing uh, prices of crude oil and all. Another reason has been the depreciation of rupee with, with respect to the dollars. The rupee which has been stabilizing, stabilized around somewhere like one dollar equal to 75 rupees has stabilized to something like one dollar, has now come around close to 81, 82 rupees. So this increases your export bill. So when you go for internationalization of rupee, when you try to settle the transactions in Indian rupees rather than in dollars, this type of problems can be solved. And the RB has introduced a new mechanism in this resort. We'll have a look into that. So India actually, uh, the first India started its trade, the, the de-dollarization. For de-dollarization, India started dealing with rupee and the ruble uh, initially. So when the Russia was in sanctions and all, India wanted to trade with Russia. So we introduced this rupee-ruble mechanism, where the trade would happen between, or the exchange would happen between rupee and ruble. There is no dollar in and the same India followed it up with Singapore, uh, Sri Lanka when Sri Lanka was facing a financial crisis and even they extended it to Mauritius. So internationalization of rupees is the process of making Indian rupee a globally accepted currency similar to the other major currencies like the US dollar, the euro, the Japanese yen, etc. Et so the objective of this is to promote this economic growth and development and also Whenever you have in the, a currency that is being increasingly internationalized, it gives much more weightage to your nation's currency. Like it gives you much more power in the global diplomacy, the economic diplomacy. But in order to do that, you need to have a whole lot of liberalizations to come up on the capital account, which is what the government is exactly trying to push out these days. Now, These are some of the measures that the government has taken in order to promote the internationalization of rupee. For example, since 2014 onwards, the government has rolled out something called as Masala Bond. The Masala Bond, also called as RTB or the rupee denominated bonds, are certain bonds that are issued by World Bank. And to be specific, IFC, the International Finance Corporation, which is an arm of, or which is a, uh, organization under the World Bank Group. What they do so over here is basically, uh, these are rupee denominated bonds. Normally, if the Indian government is to raise finances from abroad, the money has to be raised in some other like, currencies, the foreign currencies. But when it comes to Masala bond, it gives you an option of raising the funds in rupees. And also, most importantly, the repayment ha will happen in rupees. So the government need not be, or the fundraisers need not be concerned about the exchange rate volatility risk center. Okay. So that has been one item. And regarding this thing, the trade settlement in rupee using the special war strike account, I'll come to that. And government has been undertaking currency swaps with many of the nations. And also other measures like that, uh, government is trying to promote rupee set based settlement instead of clearing like whenever a transaction is being cleared, the norm is that of using dollars. Instead of going by that, the government is trying to promote rupee being more and more used. And also they are enabling the condition to link domestic rupee interest rate in the currency market with the offshore rupee markets. That is, you have the domestic rupee market, you have the foreign rupee market where this uh, masala bond, all these type of things exist. Oh, government is trying to link all these things together. So we'll you will have a unified interest rate. So, and even the government is permitting primary dealers to act as market makers, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what are the advantages of all these things? It will reduce the requirement for the foreign exchange for the nation. And it can thus reduce the balance of payment crisis or avoid the risk of a balance of payment crisis that could come some up, uh, that could potentially come up in future. And also, there will be reduced vulnerability to external shocks because of the reduced dependency on foreign currency. When you're depending too much on external currency, whatever happens on the international scene, like the, if there is a currency war happening between US and other nations, if there is any war happening between Russia and Ukraine, all these things affect us. But if you're going for more and more dollarized internationalization of your domestic currency and de-dollarization, it's not going to affect you much. It will affect, but not much anyway.
and it uh, solves the problem of foreign exchange fluctuation etc etc and improves in the uh, governments or the indians are bargaining power over the diplomatic table now this is a special wastrom mechanism that the rbi has introduced recently this is an attempt at internationalization of rupee let's have a look at how this special wastrom account and the mechanism works see this is a rupee trade settlement mechanism we'll start from over here you have a foreign exporter let's assume this is a us exporter when this us exporter sells his or her goods and services to an indian importer this red color line is a boundary so the good crosses this boundary means now it has entered the indian territory so it is being imported by the indian importer now the indian importer if he or she is to pay the foreign exporter we are assuming that the foreign ex exporter is from us the payment will have to happen in dollars right normally that will create an increasing demand for the dollar so the idea of internationalization is to remove the dollar out of the story now the indian importer need not pay the foreign exporter in dollars instead what indian uh, importer can do is the indian importer can pay the money in rupees this money will be put in an account called as a wastrom account so this wastrom account suppose this foreign exporter us based exporter has an account in some standard chartered bank and the indian importer has an account in sbi so once the indian importer gets this product through the sbi account of the indian importer this individual will input the money in indian rupees in an account of this s standard chartered bank and this standard chartered bank will have opened a wastrom account in india and that money will be deposited in that wastrom account and not in the us account so once this money is put it in the wastrom account which is in rupees the standard chartered bank will take the money and they will do the conversion the conversion is now up to them and the importer need not be worried about that and then the exporter will get the money in the dollars that's how this thing operates similarly exactly the op similar operation happen when it's a importer indian indian individual is exporting so when an indian individual is exporting the foreigner imports it money is being paid by the foreigner and this money is actually paid in dollars right but before being deposited in the wastro account the money will be converted from dollar to rupees and thus the importer will get export indian exporter will get rupees so the idea is the exporters and importers get the money in the currency of their choice but still it does not create an excessive demand that's a whole idea see this is the case of us now you think about if this is happening with russia you don't need dollars you just need rubles only so once this is happening you need not have otherwise uh, uh, all the settlements used to be standardized in dollars that standardization can do away now another term that could be up for important for the examination is the idea of a currency war so normally countries especially you have seen this in the case of countries like china us india etc they try to weaken their currency that is they depreciate their currency they deliberately depreciate their currency the objective of depreciation is to promote their exports when the current see depreciates the exports actually improves so but when one country depreciates their currency to improve the exports another country will also do the same thing so these nations will be on a war footing when it comes to the currency so this is the idea of a currency war now there is something called as a reverse currency war see if you have a look at the past one or two years indian rupee has been lose uh, losing its value with, with respect to dollar but it has not been respecting uh, losing its value with respect to other currencies even if you take the case of pound or yen or other emerging market currencies like turkish lira or brazilian peso etc etc but however 
it's a case of dollar becoming stronger rather than rupee becoming weaker but in effect both means the same thing only so the governments around the world are trying to make sure that their currency does not lose value and that they are indulging in it so when they're trying to save the value of their domestic currency from depreciation that reduces your exports but even by reducing your export the government is willing to do that because your import bill otherwise will go up so that is the idea of a reverse currency war now we'll have a look at a wto ministerial conference the 12th wto ministerial conference was held in last year it happens biennially that's once in two years so the world trade organ this ministerial conference is wto or the world trade organization's highest authority so most of the decision make uh, important decisions are taken at this ministerial authority so it will comprise representatives of all the uh, wto members normally from india or finance minister or like commerce minister of course the ministry of commerce and industries so all the countries the wto member countries send in their ministerial representation for the wto ministerial conference so we'll have a look at the important outcomes of wto ministerial conference a key area of focus during this ministerial conference has been that of fisheries fisheries has been a frequent area of discussion in the wto debates there would be this would say that there would be a check on iuu fishing illegal unreported unregulated there are certain fishing which is illegal that's clear when the government or the authorities say it is not to be fished uh, it shouldn't be fish so if you go against the rules that's a case of it illegal fish there are certain fish which is unreported it may not be illegal but it's unreported only by reporting you can keep and have an idea about the total fish stock etc etc and there will be something that's un- unregulated iuu now what happens is the countries especially if you have a look at our neighboring nation like sri lanka and all they have not been very active in preventing for checking the uh, this type of iuu fishing because when people go and fish they make money it's good for the local economy but it's bad for the global ecology so it's a question of local gains versus global losses so many nations often neglect the global losses and they would prefer the local gains so that has been happening for quite some time and this time uh the ministerial conference has introduced strict measures to make sure that this type of illegal unreported unregulated fishing can't happen for example you have this uh, bottom sea trolling bottom sea trolling is a practice whereby uh, the nets are released onto the sea floor and the nets are raised and this process uh you will get the fishers or the fishermen will get the fish of their choice in addition to that there will be a whole lot of plants other species that they do not want which will anyway be killed or lo- lose their life even when they do not have a market potential so it's very exploitative in nature so that all come under this category of iuu but nations like sri lanka has been actually actively promoting bottom sea trolling now also the ministerial conference says there should not be any subsidies provided for fishing in areas outside the exclusive economic zone you know according to the united nations conventions on the laws of the sea a, up to 200 nautical miles from your domestic territory is what the exclusive economic zone no nation should provide any subsidy to any fisherman who is conducting the trade either outside the eez or outside the rfmos rfmos are regional fisheries management organizations now that's one part we'll have a look at what this rfmo is before that we'll have a look at the other important de- deliberations of the wto's ministerial conference so this says a country can authorize production of vaccines patented elsewhere and there would be no consent required as well as there would be no limit on exports so a country can authorize the production so for example if a oh, this is in the context of the covid vaccine even if the covid vaccine is patented in any nation uh, yeah india can or india or any nation can actually pr- 
authorize its production and they could even export it that's what it says and also when it comes to electronic transmissions uh, application there is a moratorium that lies in the applying of duties to electronic trade or electronic transmission that's happening which is being extended again for one more year uh, till the next ministerial conference so it will this electronic transmission covers ebooks music downloads etc etc so th this would say these things should not be uh, taxed when it crosses borders so that moratorium has been extended further and with regard to food security there would not be export restrictions on world foods uh, safety programs uh, for food security in other countries also although the domestic food security will take priority i will focus our attention of this thing called as rfmos or regional fishing management organization fisheries management organization it is basically an international body made up of countries it's a group organization of group of countries so this group of countries they share a practical or a financial interest in managing and conserving the fish stock in a particular region uh, i'll show you how a rfmo looks like so these are the prominent rfmos in the world so there are approximately 17 rfmos and five of them are like called as tuna rfmos because they focus mostly uh, mostly on the tuna fish now this five rfmos manage around is covers around 91 percentage of the world's oceans so for example you take this iotc it's a big rfmo the indian ocean tuna commission so it is a group of nations uh, which has fishing interests in this indian ocean all the south asian southeast asian any part of african nations they form this collective and they will create laws and regulations about at what period of the year fishing can be done what is the quantity of fishing can be done what are the guidelines that should should be followed when fishing is to be done all these things type of things they will look at so these are no so these are nations that share a practical or a financial interest in managing and conserving the fish stock in a particular region this include coastal sto states whose waters are home to at least of an identified fish stock and distant water fishing nations whose fleets travel to areas where a fish stock is found so that's a basic idea of an rfm now apart from that now now we'll move a bit on to agriculture Uh, mostly some agriculture related topics some of them we have already discussed in our classes uh, and also some on uh, our uh, sessions on budget and survey so something that's very important or something that's very um ground could be ground breaking that has come up in the past year has been something called as nano urea you know urea is a nitrogenous fertilizer and it is a most widely used fertilizer in uh, uh, utilize fertilizer in india however urea faces the issue of excess usage and wastage for example uh, people since urea is subsidized for example you get a ton of urea somewhere around 7000 rupees and all whereas all the other fertilizers are even more expensive than this so when the farm the farmers in order to minimize the expenditure on the fertilizers they would just use more and more of urea rather than using other fertilizers so they're trying to substitute urea with other fertilizers which is never ever in the best interest of the soil and the plants so the plants might grow in the short term but the soil deteriorates in the long term so one issue has been that of over usage of urea and also the idea of nutrient use efficiency so what is the idea of a nutrient use efficiency whenever you provide some fertilizers to the soil there will be large amount of nutrients a portion of which will be absorbed by the plants a portion of which will be wasted so when you apply this conventional urea in urea in the powder form what happens is around 30 to 50 percentage of the nutrients are absorbed by the plants the remaining is wasted they are run off and they goes into this water bodies and cause issues like eutrophication algal bloom etc etc but however nano urea has been developed by ifcos nano biotechnology research center so it's form of more of a liquid uh, urea so it is a chemical nitrogen fertilizer with nano nitrogen particles which has a size something like 20 to 50 nanometers so it increases the surface area 
which means the nitrogen use efficiency or the nutrient use efficiency will also be higher. So the efficiency almost increases to something like 80 percent. It almost doubles, which means if na once nano, nano urea is in the market, the farmers will have to use only half the amount of urea that they were been earlier using. So this improves uh, crop productivity and all. Now we know the issues of the urea, uh, problems that is being caused by urea going waste, for example, issues like the contamination of soil and water bodies. And also once this urea gets into the atmosphere, it causes many dangerous or hazardous oxides, nitrous oxides, etc., etc. So nano urea along with its increased production of traditional urea can help India eliminate the urea import by 2025. In India, substantial amount of urea and some other fertilizers are also imported, which increases the government's import bill and the dependency on other nations. And interestingly, a po large portion of these imports of fertilizers and all comes from these nations like Russia, Ukraine and all. So when these countries went into war, the nation had to suffer or had to basically shamble for supplies. So these type of problems can be solved. Now, We'll have a look at millets or not much on the millets because we have anybody did a discussion on the millets in our budget sessions because the government is exclusively focusing so much on the millets this time. So 2023 has been declared as the International Year of Millets by the UNGA. The rest we have already discussed it. Now we'll do a bit on sugar cane because there has been something happening on sugar cane, FRP, etc. So in 2021-22, India became the world's biggest sugar pro pro producer and Brazil was in the second spot. India also emerged as the world's second largest exporter of sugar, earning nearly 40,000 crores of foreign exchange. That's tremendous money. Now, sugar cane, any crop you study, with respect to agriculture, there are different dimensions of it. For example, anything in agriculture or Agriculture in India is an economic issue. It is an issue. It is a social issue. It is a political issue. It is also an issue of, of science and technology. So whenever you study agriculture, whenever you study about crops, you have to think of all of these dimensions. So any crop you study about, you need to study about what are the climatic conditions for the crop to grow and where all the cultivation of the crop happens in India. So when you have a look at sugar cane, it needs hot and humid climate with an average temperature of something between 21 to 27 degrees Celsius. With respect to rainfall, sugar cane is a water guzzling crop. It requires a large amount of rainfall. See, in the context of India, like the major crops that have been cultivated in India, sugar cane, paddy, palm oil, these are the most water guzzling crops. The water requirements of sugar cane are so high, and that's where the problem lies. The sugar cane owing to its high profitability nature, is being cultivated in places like Marathwada and all. You have a look at an area like Marathwada, which is a drought-prone area. You're cultivating sugarcane in an already drought-prone area that further depresses your water table. So that should never happen. So it requires a large amount of water. So And it requires water, those kinds of soil which can retain a large amount of water. Uh, water and normally the deep rich somi soil is ideal for its growth. Now if you have a look at the sugarcane cultivation belt you have largely two belts one is in the north which is a conventional belt the these regions Madhya Pradesh, UP these type of regions and relatively off late uh, this sugarcane manufacturing has moved towards to the south post independence at off late and this has been a UPSC main question paper uh, sometime in the recent times. So now they are more concentrated in areas like Maharashtra or Karnataka, Andhra. Why has it moved to this region and what is it happening presently? One, the mills in the southern India are relatively newer mills, which means they use newer techniques and they are more productive. The mills in the northern India are the old uh, mills and which means the productivity is higher in the south. Also, uh, the, the conditions are better for sugar accumulation in the south. See, the sugar cane, it is a weight losing raw material. So it has to be processed immediately. So in the south, since the conditions are a bit more hotter, not colder, 
it gives you a longer time to harvest rather than in the the harvesting period is so small and so the processing period also has to be very small which means into large amount of post harvest losses this can be cut down in the soil and the soil you see the black soils of the deccan are the best kind of soil which can accommodate sugarcane and south has relatively longer hours of uh, sunshine compared to the northern regions the skies are co uh, cooler and clear and also the latitudinal position of this region these are the regions why this has been moving towards the south and also when you have a look at the mills uh, most of the mills in the south are operated through a cooperative model the cooperative model does not work well in the north so that is also another reason now you have to be mindful of the pricing mechanism of the sugarcane you have this thing called as frp which is called as the fair and remunerative price fair and remunerative price so what exactly is this this is msp uh, they have named it separately but when you have a look at the cacp website they would say that sugarcane has an msp it's basically mean frp is also a type of msp so you keep that in mind and how does the frp me mechanism work suppose uh, the mechanism of frp operation is very much different from that of the msp operation so this works on the idea of cane reservation system cane reservation system for example let's assume there is an area like this or oh, okay uh, you take this this is the entire field and there are sh four sugar mills 1 2 3 4 the entire area will be divided into four and you will have farmers the green color dot uh, are farmers and the yellow color one is the mills okay so now what happens is according to the cane reservation system we have this sugar mill one the sugar mill one is supposed to take from this first rectangle a that is all the farmers falling within the area of the first rectangle a those farmers are the ones who has to give their sugar to the sugar mill one if they try to sell it to sugar mill 2 or 3 or 4 the sugar, those sugar mill will not buy so you have some form of a tying relationship between the mills and the farmers what is the advantage of this farmers get an assured source like place where to sell and when the farmers in the area 1 area a go to the sugar mill 1 they can refuse it so farmers get an assured source of revenue sugar mills get and a short source of raw materials so this is how the cane reservation works so the uh, mills take this money and the government will give the fair or and remunerative price to the sugar mill owners and the mill owners will pay this money to the farmers that's how this mechanism works now the government has also been in the recent times in uh, conducting the agriculture census so this is not something that gets so much of an attention but also uh, upsc has asked think this thing once it was quite some time back but they have asked it so the present uh, agriculture census is going to happen the 11th agriculture census is happening in 2021 22 so it is, it happens during a period of 5 years and it has been it started since 1970 71 as part of a program called as wc which is the world census of agriculture which is conducted by fao now this is a main source of information if you have want to have an idea about the land holding that uh, what is the size of the land holding the distribution by class almost all the land related data you get in agriculture census land related data crop related data etc etc so this is this is the 11th cent agriculture census that is happening and also something similarly you have a livestock census also which collects the data on livestock now first time for the first time the data will be conducted using smartphones and tablets for faster and accurate enumeration now another thing that is happening is the asia palm oil conference this is formed by five major oil importing countries palm oil importing countries india pakistan nepal bangladesh and sri lanka 
So the substantial amount of the palm oil that is being imported by these countries come from the Southeast Asian nations like uh, Indonesia, Malaysia and all. So the buyers have formed a collective so that they will get a better bargaining power when it comes to buying and so that they can make sure that they, they get these things at a relatively cheaper price and make the imports are sustainable. So if the Indonesia is the major supplier and it's the largest sub producer and exporter of palm oil to, of, in the world. Now we'll have a look at something called DMF or the District Mineral Foundation. Uh, the idea of a District Mineral Foundation is basically to assist the project affected people in mining related areas. So whenever a mineral resource is being found in a particular district and the government starts the mine, mining of those, a large amount of people will be affected. We'll call them PAP or the project affected people. Those people, uh, some of them will have lost their houses, some of them will have lost their livelihoods. All these type of things exist. They will be suffering from all of these type of issues. So the loss of house, livelihood, etc., etc. So you need to make sure. That, but the resources, the minerals, are not going to be exclusively used for the betterment of these people. It will go into the welfare of the overall nation. So the idea is you need to compensate these people whose lives and livelihoods have been affected badly appropriately. Then you have for that you have something called as a DMF or a District Mineral Foundation. So what they will do is they will create perspective plans for the systematic development of these areas development developed by areas which are affected by the mining related activities. Now, where would, would the money of a DMF come from for these activities? A particular percentage of the royalty that a miner. So whenever a an entity is mining a mineral resource, a portion of the money of the revenue has to be given to the government as royalty. From the royalty, a particular percentage will be given to the DM, given to the DMF for their local development. So the DMF will have to conduct uh, surveys and create plans about how to create or how to develop the society and so on. So there will be logs up, uh, there will be grams about which assist in the development of this plants and all. So basically it's more of a plan of a decentralized development where the honest is left to the local bodies for this assistance of these sorts. Now you have this MMDRA, which is the Mines and Minerals Development and Regulation Amendment Act of 2015. So under this is where the DMF came up in 2015. So according to this, the DMF is created in each district that has mining. So all districts which has mining will have a DMF. And if the, the companies presently, if a new company gets and getting a, gets a lease, uh, 10 percentage of the royalty will be given to the DMF. Whereas if it is the case of older companies who has been having leases before 2015, 30 percentage of the royalty will be given to DMF. Now these funds are collected by the non, so collected are managed by the non-profit trust and they are to be used for the welfare of the mining affected population, including the tribal as well as the forest dwelling communities. And each district will have a separate trust and they will undertake the operations of the local district only. Now, this is also something very important, the recent definition of the definitional change that happened with regarding MSMEs. Why is something like MSME so important for the Indian economy? The basic reason being that one, they contribute a, lot, a decent portion to the GDP, but rather than their decent contribution to the GDP, their most important lies in their employment generation potential. So they're very labor intensive. So this MSMEs are actually the solution for India's employment crisis and not something like the industries or the services that you have. So government uh, recently changed the definition for MSMEs at their classification. So the one above is the early classification of MSPs and one below is the revised classification. So we'll have a look at the device classification and we'll compare with the older one. Now, when you have the older or the earlier classification, you had separate criteria for manufacturing sector MSMEs as well as the services sector MSMEs. Now, you don't have that classification. Now, the classification is more or less uniform. The manufacturing and services does not matter what type of MSME you are. 
but it will be determined based on your investment and turnover. And earlier, the only criterion that were used to recognize whether a firm is an investment, uh, like a micro, small, medium enterprise, was their investment. Now, in addition to investment, you're including an additional variable, which is that of turnover. Turnover means the overall sales that happens in a year. Now, you have the micro, small, and medium enterprises. So the micro enterprises are where the investment is less than one crore and the turnover is less than five crore. Any enterprise that meets both of these criteria will be called as a micro enterprise. A small enterprise is one where the investment is between 1 to 10 crore and the turnover is between 5 to 50 crore. A medium enterprise is one where the investment is greater than 10 crore but less than 20 crore and the turnover is between 50 to 100 crores. I would re recommend you to buy hard these newer definitions because they could ask these type of definitions for the exam. And this is the definition. Say what the government see, uh, says. The logic behind this is that uh, now you the MSME is earlier. Whenever an MSME grows, if you're an MSME, you get large amount of benefits. But when you are not an MSME, or when you have grown beyond the potential, for example, according to the earlier definitions, a medium enterprise was one where the investment was between two to five crores. So if you are investing something like 10 crore, you are not no, no longer an MSME and all the benefits that was being accrued to the MSME will not be available to you. So that this was creating a constraint or disincentivizing these MSMEs to grow. So in order to remove this thing, the government has introduced a newer definition where the range has been expanded. But there is another story of that also. Uh, the critic of this is that now what happens is Relatively larger firms are now being called as MSMEs, which in reality are not MSMEs. And as a result, the government support and the funding will be diverted to these bigger firms rather than the smaller actually deserving MSMEs. There is also a critical argument to that. Now, a couple of terms relating investment or the sources of investment, uh, we'll have a look into that. One is the idea of a venture capitalist and the other one is the idea of an angel investor. Who is a venture capitalist? A venture capitalist is a person or a firm that invests in small companies generally using money pulled from investment companies, large corporations, venture funds, etc. Et the idea of a venture capitalist or the intention of a venture capitalist or an angel investor is both to fund relatively newer companies. Okay. Then, wherein lies the difference? If you're speaking about a VC or a venture capitalist, the venture capitalist does not come with his or her own money. They pool in the money of other investors, like there will be people who has put their money in pension funds and all. This money is being pooled and invested into companies. So there will be a venture capitalist. He's basically like a manager of funds. He would pool the money, invest it somewhere, make returns out of it, repay. So what is their core motive? Returns. So they would invest in small companies. Obviously, it would help in the folk, uh, small companies to grow, but their main motive is the returns. Whereas you have the angel investors. What would an angel investor do? See, an angel investor is actually not much interested in the profit. They are, they might be. Uh, the logic of giving the name angel over there is they are more of less like an angel. They bring in their own money. They don't use others' money. So when it's their own money, they need not be that much mindful of profit. They bring in their own money. They invest in very small businesses which shows very high potential. They give money, not just money. Venture capitalists just would give the money. Whereas the angel investors would give the money, would give them hand-holding support. For example, you have these people like Narayana Murthy, uh, Nandan Nilekani, all these people uh, or even uh, uh, Azim Premji, all these type of people being investing as angel investors. So these are people who have developed a, a startup into a global behemoth, a big companies. So they have a whole lot of experience in dealing with that. This expertise will also be transferred to the angel investors. So 
compared to the magnitude of the funds the venture capitalist brings in substantial amount of money compared to angel investors because the angel investors are high net worth individuals but it's ultimately their own money there's a limit to how much they can invest but venture capitalists have a huge amount of money but venture capitalists are more invested interested in profit than the angel investors okay now we'll have a look at this in this occupational structure uh, this is context this is important in the context of india now facing a high unemployment in the recent times so what is this thing all about so when you have a look at india's uh, occupational structure the latest survey data and on 44 percentage of the people are still living in agriculture still depend working on agriculture this is a direct dependency the indirect dependency goes even much higher so you have to be mindful of this data around 44 percentage of the people are still working in agriculture around another 30 percent works in service sector and around 25 percent works in the 25 26 percent works in the industrial sector now we'll have a look at employment unemployment and the metrics of unemployment and types of unemployment these things are extremely important and upsc has asked about the metrics of unemployment and also the types of unemployment more, multiple times in the very recent years also. so when you have a look at employment or unemployment basically if you have a job if you are actively looking for a job and you don't have a job that's what you call as an unemployment so you classify it as voluntary unemployment and involuntary unemployment voluntary unemployment would be, for example among you there would be people who would be preparing for the upsc civil service examination with like you must be doing it after your college you might be you might have resigned your job for that so you are out of job but it's your choice that's voluntary unemployment see it would be because either because you don't want to work at there would be people who are voluntary unemployed who don't want to work at all uh, or they might not be satisfied with the existing wages or they would be expecting a higher wages so on and so forth that's a case of a voluntary unemployment how about an involuntary unemployment involuntary unemployment would be like the people are willing to work at the prevailing wages but they are unable to find work so this is what you normally call as unemployment the other people are out of the labor force we'll explain the concept of a labor force in short in, in a due while well. before explaining the concept of labor force we'll have a look at the different types of unemployment and i think upsc has asked uh, cyclical unemployment um, and also seasonal unemployment and discussed unemployment all those three has been asked and that does not mean they will not ask that in future which means that basically mean this table becomes all the more important in the present times when you are facing an unemployment crisis so having a look at different types of unemployment to start we'll have this idea this type of unemployment which is called a cyclical unemployment so cyclical unemployment has got more to do with the business cycles actually one second business cycles so the economy would at times grow then it would there would be periods of low growth there would be periods of negative growth then there would be periods of recovery this is how the cycles would look like so let's assume this is 0% growth rate when your economy is going this is what you refer to as a boom period then the growth rate slows down if it slows down uh, continuously for three quarters it's called as a recession then you have periods of depression where your economy instead of growing it contracts then it recovers so in the boom phase and all and even during the recovery phase when the economy is going up more and more people will be employed but during the phases of recession and slow down and even depression a large amount of people will lose their job so this unemployment which is arising out of the cyclicalities of employment is what you call as cyclical unemployment so or cyclicalities of the business cycle so since the economy is in a particular part of the business cycle some people will be laid off and that's what you call as a cyclical unemployment and on the other hand you have the idea of a frictional unemployment this is a case of an unemployment that we were referring to earlier 
for example a person has a job the person resigns the job and looks for another job the interim period let's call it the time period t where this person does not have a job during this transition period this person is frictionally unemployed or if this person has a job decides to study something and later go for the job this period where he is unemployed and he is studying or she is studying is a, a, a period of frictional unemployment so frictional unemployment is not a permanent feature it is just a very temporary feature and the temporariness is due to the fact of uh, it uh, it's a very uh, churning or like a very short term issue to be dealt with now you have this idea of disguised or hidden unemployment what is this thing called as a disguised or hidden unemployment when you look at these people these people are unemployed but they are not positively contributing anything to the economy this is something that's mostly visible in agriculture sector for example you take a field a family run field the family has six members all of the six people will work on the field because they don't have anything else to do but even if you remove three members out of the field and only three members are working that would give the same amount of output so like for example if you are getting 100 kg output uh, on the field that only three people would be required to do that the other three people are going and working in the field just because they don't have anything else to do so in reality if you look they are working but are they contribute anything to the economy in reality no so those workers whose marginal productivity or marginal contribution is zero are called as the disguise or hidden unemployment because they are not explicitly visible and this is mostly seen in the case of agriculture that too in the case of farm run fields and uh, family run house uh, fields and why do these things exist it exists because of just because of the fact that these people do not have any alternative source of income or something to do with now another type of unemployment is seasonal unemployment seasonal unemployment is not to be confused with cyclical unemployment because cyclicality is a feature of business cycle seasonality is about the seasons that exist and the difference is seasons are more defined you know when the season is and when the off season is cyclic cycles you don't know cycles might come out of a boom for example when covid came you went into this negative part of the cycle so it was not predictable but seasonality is very much predictable you know this for example in agriculture uh there will there are places where only one season farming happens the garif season so people will have work during the garif season but after the garif season is over they will be out of work they will have to move out for something so that that is an example of seasonal unemployment one season they have job other season they don't have job and this pattern is the same for every year and be regarding tourism for example uh certain hill stations get so much tourist attraction attraction during summers when it's so hot but they do not get that same level of tourist attraction when it's in the winters whereas on the other hand the beaches and all the hot destinations will get more of tourist attraction during the winters and not in the summers so any tourist location or the people dependent on on that they will be employed for a particular period and not for a particular period so in that period they will have to look for some other job so this is an example of a seasonal unemployment and uh, another type of unemployment is the underemployment or educated underemployment so underemployment or educated unemployment is basically people doing jobs which do not exactly match their uh, qualification you see these engineers working as delivery boys it's not to belittle engineers or being the uh, delivery boy profession even i am an engineer myself uh, you see this engineers everywhere i am you anywhere you can think of you see this engineers when you i'm i'm in research i'm doing my phd you see engineers uh, doing a phd in economics sociology political science history what and what not and when you go for your field work you see uh, engineers doing farming engineers doing local trading everywhere you see engineers and also you see this so this some people would be doing out of passion 
but some people would be doing it out of desperation so these people doing it out of desperation they are doing a job which is not matching their educational requirement as qualification and that is what you call as an educator and unemployment or underemployment now you have something also called as a technological unemployment so whenever a new technology comes people are being replaced by machines see when this uh, now the chat gpt and all is coming people are very much concerned about what will happen to their jobs in the future so that is a case of a technological unemployment now there is another case, type of unemployment called as a structural unemployment the example of a structural unemployment that i have given here might give you a notion that structural unemployment and technological unemployment are more or less the same uh, but they are not structural unemployment is that when the people become unemployed whenever there is a mismatch between demand and supply if i hope you must be familiar with the basic demand and supply curve so you have the demand curve and the supply curve and there will be the equilibrium so whenever the market is out of equilibrium and the demand is greater than the supply there will be a or the supply is greater than the demand there would be a situation of excess supply some people would be unemployed it could arise due to a whole different type lot of reasons one example of which is what i say in the case of a typewriters so in the 1980s and all or even a part of the 1990s typewriting was very much fashionable so people started learning this typewriting but once computers came the typewriting became out, uh, outdated so those people there were a large number of people the supply of typewriters were higher but the demand of typewriters started to shrink so this supply demand mismatch actually created a structural unemployment and see this particular case is also a case of a technological unemployment but not all structural unemployments are technological in nature so we'll take a small break before we start our discussion with the telecom sector issues and all. we'll take a 5 minute break now we'll focus our attention on the telecom sector something has been happening on the telecom sector some re certain re reforms have happened so one thing is one thing is a case of the rationalization of agr the adjusted gross revenue uh, it would be good if you have a basic idea about the adjusted gross revenue because it has been in news for quite some time so what is this idea of agr and why has it been controversial so when the spectrums are being allocated to the telecom companies they are expected to pay a particular proportion of their profits as royalty profits or revenue or revenue profits pro proxy anything uh, of their revenue to be precise as a percentage of the revenue will be it to be given to the government as royalty but however the telecom entities for example this vodafone or airtel like airtel you can take as a classic example all of their profit might not be coming from telecom related activities airtel has a payment bank uh, they offer even other services so their profit comes from non telecom streams also but however the income tax department has been saying it does not or the government has been saying it does not matter where your profit comes from. you are a telecom entity and this revenue when you are calculating royalty as a percentage of your revenue you have to give it as a percentage of your total revenue you have to total and you have to take the total revenue that means you have to remove the component uh, you you have to even include the revenue that's coming from the non telecom revenue so that the firms have been finding it highly disproportionate and unjustified and there have been cases going on in the court and all and however the verdict was uh, in the court was not according to their uh, what the firm the telecom firms were under so this is the idea of agr but however the government has understands the crisis that the telecom sector has been in especially post the entry of jio and the government has given them a decent enough timeline to repay this and the government has said that there would be a fixed auction spectrum auction calendar an annual calendar will be created and only during these times the auctioning will happen and the government has permitted 100% foreign direct investment via the automatic route and the government has set up a telecom development for ddf to be precise we'll have a look into those but something most important or revolutionary that's happening on the telecom scene is that of the ondc the open digital network open network digital 
for open network for digital commerce or ndc so what is this this is a network based on open protocol not closed protocol which will enable local commerce across segments such as mobility grocery food order and delivery hotel booking travel etc etc so i illustrate with the help of this particular image what an ondc looks like so in the left hand side you have the existing platform centric model so it's based on the platforms platforms are at the center for example if you have a zomato zomato will have a platform and only those people who are uh, so zomato is a win like the platform provider so only those people who whom they are uh, intended in onboarding can onboard and it's not a very open network so if i am an individual who wants to create something similar to zomato i can't use zomato's platform i had to create a diff different platform different digital architecture different uh, app and all for my uh, activities but however the small vendors will find it disproportionately costly to create the softwares the apps and all but it would be great if they would be able to use the zomato's platform but existing platform does not have it uh hello that also another problem is this is segmented you have mobility platform you have ola uber uh, on they are one type of they have one type of apps uh, for the mobility related things then you have delivery platform the swiggy zomato food panda all these type of things then you have e-commerce platform like flipkart uh, amazon now what the ondc tries to say is you try to bring everything together instead of different platform for different type of product you will have one common platform it will be an open source platform for digital commerce you can trade anything you can deliver food you can uh, transport passengers you can sell your products anything can be done so eco everything will come on one common platform and the most important thing is anyone can participate you need not have an independent or an individual platform to be a participant anyone can participate so this is going to make this digital commerce pl platform more inclusive that's the whole idea of having an ondc so things like mobility grocery food ordering deliver food delivery hotel booking traveling all these things can be brought on one single platform so this can create newer opportunities to the relatively newer entrants or smaller entrants this can solve the problem curb the digital monopolies by supporting the micro small medium enterprises it is an initiative of the dpiit the department for promotion of industry and internal trade under the ministry of commerce and industries now this ondc is basically you can call it a upa of e-commerce when is upa came initially you could transact from google pay to google pay only phone pay to phone pay only paytm to paytm only now this type of interoperability has come so this it is going to be like uh, similar to the present upa framework and even better than that because in that you have only very limited type of activities happen it's going to be uh, even broader in its goals now what is this idea of tdf or the telecom development fund so there is a body called as us or a fund called as uso of the universal service obligation obligation fund so this has been recently renamed in from 2022 onwards the telecom development fund so the usof is whenever any company applies a telecom company applies for a spectrum a portion of the money that is given for the spectrum uh, by the company as part of the spectrum allocation will be put in a money called a uh, fund called as united a uh, universal service obligation fund and this fund is managed by the department of telecom and the objective of managing this fund is to promote that rural digital connectivity so by using this fund the government will undertake research related to promoting the connectivity and they will undertake various activities as a result of it they will be able to promote the digital connectivity in the rural spaces and the remote spaces so they aim to fund r and d in, and the, this usof has now been renamed as tdf or the telecom development fund so they aim to fund 
R and D in rural specific communication technology application, and they form synergy between M Academy, Academia, startups, research institute, etc. The scheme aims to promote technology ownership and indigenous manufacturing, create a culture of technology co-innovation, reduce imports, boost export opportunity, and the creation of intellectual property. Under this scheme, USOF is also targeting to develop standards to meet countrywide requirements. now there is something called as this green gdp coming up you know what gdp is how gdp is calculated uh, to be preaching gdp at this stage would be mundane because i hope all of you must be very well versed with the concept of gdp its measurements what all it has what all it does not has etc etc now what is the idea of green gdp the problem with gdp is gdp just takes into consideration the growth or the productive part of it it does not considers the environmental story whenever an economy is growing your gdp grows if there is a potential of environmental destruction that's been happening so you need to have incorporate this element over there that's what the idea of a green gdp is. a green gdp incorporates the environmental uh, element also so you have a system called as ncads the national Ca natural capital accounting and valuation for e ecosystem services that is the standard that the most be uses for environmental accounting and in india uttarakhand has become the first state to calculate its gdp which is the gross environmental product that is the gdp which incorporates for the environmental component also there are a couple of cur curves uh, it could be important for the exam those are the kusnets curve and the environmental kusnets curve so what does a kusnet curve say kusnet's curve is basically a curve about inequality it would look something like this on the x axis you have the gdp per capita or the per capita income on the y axis you have the inequality of a nation this is a kusnet's curve so kusnet's curve is a plot between the per capita income of a nation and the inequality what this would say is as the per capita income of a in nation increases initially that is as the nation grows inequality also grows but this will growth will happen only till a particular point of per capita income after per capita income has reached a particular point then what will happen is the inequality instead of increasing it will start coming down it will reduce okay so inequality will reduce that's what so initially as the economy grows inequality would increase then after a particular point this society has become more egalitarian and progressive and then this inequality would form that is what a kusnet curve would say this was introduced by simon kusnet a, a very prominent economist and this simon kusnet is the same person who introduced the, uh, the concept of gdp as well now there is a modified environmental kusnet curve environmental kusnets curve is very similar except for the fact that on the y axis instead of having inequality you will have something like pollution or the environmental destruction as the economy grows initially there will be a whole lot of pollution and all happening but after a period of time the economy realizes the negative impact is pollution and all causes and then it starts to come down that's the whole idea of an environmental kusnets curve so the kusnets curve shape is that of an inverted u so the policy implication of this is uh, nations automatically will reduce inequality or the pollution in the long run but this is not something that you can empirically see over a period of time now we'll have a glance at na which is the national anti profiteering agency anti profiteering agency so what is this national anti profiteering agency all about so when the gst was introduced the national anti profiteering agency was also introduced the idea of national anti profiteering agency was that so before gst the government was of the view that after gst the taxes on many products would come down so when the prices taxes on this product come down 
the benefits should reach the end consumers so in order for that the com- whoever is producing the products should reduce its prices so if someone is not reducing or is, uh, is not transmitting the price reduction which is a result of the gsp reduction to the consumers they are to be held accountable by the national anti profiteering agency and this agency will investigate these issues and the appropriate action will be taken but however now the gst rates are more or less stabilizing there are less changes happening so the national anti profiteering agency is going to wind up its operation and now this task will be handed over to cca so the gst is of the view that you don't need a separate agency for this you already have a competition commission let them look into this but to be frank the competition commission is not happy with this idea because competition commission looks into competition aspects but it's a different side of the story they look into uh, how are the companies performing are they competing properly and this is a whole different mandate that has been now been attached to the competition commission which comes under the cbic but they are not very happy with it we we'll like to see how this thing pans out and i have attached a link over here you can have a look at the link for a more, more detailed discussion on that now we'll focus our analysis on a bit on digital taxes a bit on black money certain important terminologies over there so the idea of digital tax has been looming for some time you must have heard about this t- term called as gafa tax you have this firm gafa stands for google amazon facebook apple these are all us based entities us based firms they a large amount of the transactions they they do or the large amount of the profit that they make are outside the jurisdiction of us but the problem is suppose if google is making some profit from its advertising in india since google does not have an office in india it's not possible to tax them in india it's because we have this provision of the resident based taxation so google will pay the taxes for this in us amazon will pay taxes for their profits in india in us so all these entities are making several tremendous profit across the world but they are paying the tax only in the us so nations like india felt this as a huge injustice and they decided to protest and take over this issue to the oecd and it has been taken up and in the government indian government ta- uh, started taxing the digital tax the government said that uh, if the google is getting this much amount of revenue per year from the advertising revenue they should give like something like 6 percentage of that as indian taxes so this is also an attempt in the series of measures called as peps the base erosion and profit shifting you must be aware of this but i'll give you a quick recap of how the bps of the base erosion and profit shifting works suppose the tax rate in india is 30 percentage and the tax rate in us is 15 percentage google makes a 100 crore profit in india which means they will have to pay a 30 crore profit in india so this is the tax base tax base is the amount on which the tax is to be paid let's assume this is 30 crore the tax base is 30 crore but if they are paying this money in us it, it they need to pay only 15 crore so obviously google would prefer paying these taxes in us than in india which means the tax base of india is being shifted eroded and being shifted to the us that is the idea of base erosion and profit shifting so you shift your profits and thus erode the taxes over here and show that the taxes are over there now this is where the oecd comes up with this idea of global minimum corporate taxes they said no nation can reduce their taxes below 15 percentage if there is no minimum floor what would happen you take a nation like mauritius mauritius would say to google hey, you do one thing instead of you setting up your office in us you set up an office in mauritius google mauritius here you need to pay only 1 percentage of the taxes so what they will do is they will, instead of taking this profit from india to us they will shift this to mauritius and then they will pay the uh, taxes to mauritius 
So Mauritius government would get one crore as taxes. The loss to the Indian government here is 30 crore. Who gains? It's a company that gains. So when the countries are in a desperate cutthroat competition to attract these investors, the who suffers? The sufferer is ultimately the country. Uh, the company gains and the countries suffer and the public taxation revenue suffers and the people suffer. In order to prevent this is why the OECD came up with a package called as the BEPS GMCT package, which says that you cannot at no circumstance, no nation should be taxing any company below 15 percent. Now, India taxes the digital services of people like Google and all in something called as equalization levy and all. So this is the idea of base erosion profit shifting. These are the tax avoidance strategies. Where multinational companies, which multinational companies employ for reducing their tax basis. So a company needs to pay tax for incomes or profits they earn. In recent times, the MNCs are developing sophisticated and refined tax planning practices to avoid tax by shifting their income or profit to other countries, especially to tax havens. So this is the yeah, there comes the term called as tax haven. We'll have a look into this idea of tax haven and also the round tripping aspect. Now. There is another problem called as round tripping. This is something connected with money laundering. So before going there, I'll give you just a brief idea about what money laundering is. Crudely put, money laundering is a process of making your money white. The conversion, it's a process by which black money is converted into white money. So if I have some black money, there are many various tools of money laundering as a result of which I can make my money black. So round tripping is one practice in there. See what happens in round tripping is you have an Indian individual who had made a large amount of money through black sources. It's a black money. So what this person would do is this person, person would transfer this money into some shell company in Mauritius. A shell company is a company that exists just on paper. This company does not have any substantial economic activity. The company uh, does not undertake any physical production. They would have an office. They would have a bank account, most importantly. At times, they don't even have an office. There has been instances where multiple shell companies are registered in one single office, uh, one single address, and when you go and see, there are no offices at all. So... So these are, there are instances of, these are just money, exists for the purposes of money laundering. So the money from an Indian company will be transferred to a shell company based in nations like Mauritius. And that money would come back to India. When that money comes back to India, it is labeled as profit made by this company. But actually, there is no profit being made by this company. So money that was made in India goes outside through illegal sources, obviously, uh, and it comes back. And once it comes back, it is now the profit that's being earned in Mauritius and it is coming after taxes are being paid in Mauritius. And that will be very small taxes. Now, but however, there is an individual called as A. It was his money that went and he got the money. And what is his gain in this whole story? He need to pay only very nominal amount as taxes in Mauritius. This is how they play the whole game. And this is the idea of round tripping. The money goes from India, evades Indian tax authorities, pays a nominal taxes in Mauritius by uh, doing these activities in shell companies and they get their money back. So this operates, this base erosion and all operates through systems like transfer pricing. So what is this idea of transfer pricing? So what is transfer pricing? So transfer pricing is like, suppose there is a company called as, okay, Samsung. Samsung originally being a South Korea based company, you have Samsung Korea. Then you have Samsung undertaking manufacturing in India, Samsung India Limited, okay? So what is profit? Profit is the difference between revenue and cost. So if your costs are higher, the profits are lower. So if the company can show they have a higher cost to the tax authorities, that means they are having a lower profit. Lower profit means they have to pay a lower income tax. So what would 
the samsung india do the samsung is not interested in tax paying taxes in india so let's assume the samsung makes a profit of revenue of 100 crore and their actual cost is something like 20 crore so they have a profit of 80 crore and they have to pay a tax on this but however samsung samsung finds another way of reducing the uh, the taxes that they pay so of this 20 crore this is their expenses let's assume they are taking materials worth 10 crore and buying this from samsung korea which is their mother company so this 10 crore come from samsung korea but since this is mother company they can inflate the bill so they will inflate the bill instead of 10 crore to 40 crore so now the overall expenses of the samsung company would become 50 crores okay Now, this would become something like 50 crore. Now, their profits are being reduced to 50 crore. And they, now they need to pay tax only on 50 crore and not on the 80 crore. Since, so which is basically meaning the Samsung India is paying 40 crore to four commodities worth only 10 crore. They are overpaying 30 crore. They would not do this overpayment to some other random company but since these are mother companies it's good for the overall company so this is the idea of transfer pricing that is it is an accounting practice in which a price that one division in a company charges another division of the company is overpriced so in order to prevent this when this happens the profit is actually now being shifted from india to south korea and there is a base erosion happening so there is some principle called as an arm's length principle. Arm's length principle would say, see, those companies which are at an arm's length distance, so like after your arm's distance, that is the stranger companies or distant companies, whatever price you are charging for these arm's length companies, that should be the price that you are charging to your sister companies also. That is the that is how the BEPS is trying to navigate over this thing. Okay. Now we have this idea of tax haven. We I have been speaking so much about Mauritius. Why is Mauritius so important over here in this whole story? See, Mauritius is a tax haven. Mauritius is a nation which provides whose tax rates are so low. Mauritius do not have so much economic activities apart from tourism. So they are offering an option to the companies. You do one thing. You can register your company over here. You can transfer your profits over here and then you take your money back. In the process, you do one thing. You just pay us a small tax, 0.1% taxes. 0.1% is so low when it comes to taxation. But when it comes to a nation like Mauritius, they do not have any cost in this. The, the money is not generated over here. So a large amount of money is coming here. And 0.1% of that large amount even is substantially good enough for them because they do not have any costs cost associated so tax haven are normally defined as jurisdictions with very low taxes or even no taxes at all and they have effective they do not have proper information mechanism so if you try to get this information about who which all companies are registered in mauritius and who all are paid how much taxes when and all you would not get accurate information on that and there is lack of transparency about many of their activities so these are the tax havens, how tax havens operate. So as on 2000, the OECD has identified more than 35 countries or jurisdictions as tax havens. What makes them attractive, it's like the minimal rate of taxation and the confidentiality clauses. And all. Now, the government, especially in this budget and all, has been pushing for something called as OIFCs or the offshore finance, financial sectors. See, any financial center in India, if you... Mumbai is a, relative, is a financial center, but a major chunk of the transaction, the financial transaction that happens in Mumbai are that of Indians. An offshore financial center is something where the focus of the financial transaction is not of that of Indians, instead that of non-residents in Mumbai. So it will have the following characteristics. So it will be primarily engaged in business of non-residents. Uh, there will be like they will try to there will be an offshore financial center is set up 
there will be a large amount of investment banks and all coming in which will try to bring in money from other sources do this uh, type of investment activities and all and p notes are an instrument using that the p notes so basically you need to understand the instrument of p note as well participatory note suppose if i want i am a us investor i want to invest in indian stock market i have to list with sebi and thus invest but that is a difficult process and also if my money is black if my source if i am an indian investor who is trying to round trip my money and all this is not possible so what they use is an instrument called as a p note or a participatory note so instead of me directly investing with sebi i would give my money to a foreign institutional investor who would invest on my behalf and when they invest on my behalf they would give me a note saying that this is my money and this will be returned in due course and that note is what is called as the participatory so by that we come to the end of our discussions on current affairs thank you